Welcome, citizens of the globe, to the Front End Heroes podcast, where we discuss all things villainous and heroic about the front end of software development. My name is Evan Payne, and with me, as always, is my co-host, Scott Francis. Um, Scott, how are you doing today? All good. Um, yeah, sun shining. Um, the world's going back into lockdown. It's, um, but we're still smiling. <laughs> how about you? Very good. Yeah, I'm I'm hanging in there, still smiling. <laughs> uh, at least the sun is out. Uh, today's episode is sponsored by Netcentric, an award-winning Adobe Global Alliance partner. Both Scott and I work here as senior front-end software engineers, and we're glad as ever to have their support with this show. Today, we have a guest speaker. Uh, Ignacio, if you could introduce yourself, please. Hello, everyone. Yes, uh, thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm a front-end developer also with you. In, a, in our company here. And here I've been working uh, in, several, in several projects and I learned a lot. And, and finally, I think I, uh, I've been amazed by myself in my free time into, into a world that I, I hope we can speak today. And, and uh, this world is the world of uh, writing and doing more by writing less. And and I, I hope I hope we can talk about this later on uh, with this belt. Uh, and I don't know. Uh, I don't know what yeah, to say, okay. actually. No, that's great. Thanks. So yeah, Ignacio Bustos is a, a, one of our coworkers and um, has been doing some really interesting things lately in a few different areas. So we wanted to discuss those further. Uh, today's episode is called An Everyday Hero. And it's based around the concept that you know we we tend to reach for frameworks and things when we're going with our JavaScript, Angular, and Vue, and the rest. And um, there's some new push towards not doing that at all, both in the way of you know using what's actually available, or at the very least doing your build at uh, or or creating your apps at build time to render just really vanilla JavaScript and only use what you need. And one of the um, forefronts of that is Svelte. Um, if you haven't checked out Svelte yet and you're worried about, you know, like, hey, and there's another front-end framework, geez, um, it, you know, it's it's gained maturity. A new version came out uh, pretty recently that um, really fixes a lot of the initial hiccups maybe that there were. And having tried it out myself and I had a great experience with it, not wanting to, honestly, I've, you know, I don't need another framework in my life, but um, yeah, Ignacio, maybe you can say a bit more about how you got into Svelte in the first place and what your, ben what benefits you saw, because I know you've been using Angular before and some other stuff as well. Oh, yes. I've been using Angular like 10 years ago with Angular 1. Uh, I think Angular was the first framework, no? In the market? Or it was React? Uh I'm not sure. Well, either uh, way, either there's, way. There's also jQuery was the first framework, Ooh. right? <laughs> yes, actually, yes. If we include jQuery, yes. Let's not yes. Get, let's not get started. In, <laughs> let's not get Ignacio started on jQuery. <laughs> no. <laughs> so so uh, compared to Angular, uh, I I was amazed by Angular, especially when Angular two came out, and compared to Angular, uh, I was feeling that. Uh, the rest of the frameworks and has the same issue than Angular, that it was that they were implementing too many features out of the box, but they were included it, including them into the box of your of your framework, and it was making the the your your application to start to get bigger and bigger, and without even you adding too many features to it. And last year, I think for by chance, someone commented and posted about this, about this is built a new framework. And I took a look at, onto it and it's, I, I got amazed by how simple it is. It's, the documentation is, on, is in only in one page and, and you can read it very fast. It's something that I read it even many times. Sadly, it's something very sad, but even in weekends, I read it again because I want to see what, what changed. Uh, but it's built, uh, makes you uh, reduce like 40% uh, like of your code that you write in a page uh, for, for, for every application and every component, and you will do the same. And the result of this is a much cleaner, much uh, 
a smaller uh, application and a smaller script that you will have in the browser. And of course, much more efficient and faster on, on the end users for the experience of the end users. Yes. Yeah. So, I mean, um, how, how does that, how does it do that? I mean, when you look at the actual stuff that you're writing, you know, it's, it's feels similar to the other things, especially it's feels similar to me to view because you have the single file um, application where you write your HTML and your CSS and your JavaScript kind of all together. But like, what, what is it that makes it different from Vue, let's say? Uh, oh, and how my, does it make it smaller? Well, uh, one of the big things that actually Spelt did the th- uh, 3.0 version, 3.0, uh, it was the reactivity. He put a real effort into improving reactivity uh, on the application, on the app itself. So he t- he started to think uh, in a different way than the rest of the frameworks. And he first, uh, so so you know, Svelte is not a framework, so to say. It's a, it's a compiler instead. You you will see beautiful code in your site, but in the end, it's only a, a normal custom, a normal default HTML for the end user, normally, only uh, with some exception. But with this, uh, he put a, 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 um, extreme effort on the reactivity. Um, he realized that, like for example, React, React uh, do all the the behavior and detecting the changes that you do in the in the component, but uh, a per com- in a per component basis, which means that every component treats the, treats its code, its uh, state in like a black box. So he doesn't care how it works. He only has an input and an output. And every time the output or the input change, he renders the entire box again. Uh, th- in this case, Esbel decided to move away the, ba- the, the values of, the, of the, the reactive values inside every each component into the language itself. In other words, uh, a component, a button component, will not have the reactivity written in it. It will be written in the language and therefore whichever other component is affected by the change of the button, the reaction is faster and cleaner and the, uh, and the dependencies are like uh, in the historical Excel uh, approach where, uh, I don't know if you know Excel, I guess you should, but in the 70s, the Excel was designed uh, in a way where you can have formulas and you can have uh, cells that are depending on other cells. So the way Svelte is built it is the same way. The, uh, in a way that the, if, a ce- if a cell depends on another one, we first render the other one, and then we render this one. And we don't render the entire board. React is re- rendering the entire Excel at the entire page of cells every time one cell has been changed. And this is actually a, a, a life-changing in the in the way of reac- how reactivity works in, in frameworks nowadays. Yeah, I mean, with Angular, it was the same sort of thing. You, you Eventually, you have control um, over the way things work. You, you, you know, you can, you can turn on uh, change detection uh, strategy uh, on push so that it is more pure, if you will, it only does inputs and only does outputs. And then the renderer can, or the, the virtual DOM can know that it needs to, you know, just check this component. And if the inputs and outputs are changed, it doesn't need to re-render it. But still, it's really hard to implement that across the whole application. So when you turn on some of these like magic uh, dev tools that they have, where you can see the component structure the component tree and you know you click on a button and you see this cascade of changes going up and down the whole application it's kind of like well that seems inefficient yes Um, i remember the ng zone the ng famous mm -hmm. ng zone from angular um to switch it maybe back over to you scott um how is this sitting with you i mean you've been working with a lot of just vanilla javascript does this concept of reactivity make sense to you it kind of makes sense to me. Um, like I touched Angular, uh, back like Angular one, Angular two. Um, I'm actually like the, I feel kind of like the opposite to you, Evan, because like you said, Oh, I don't need another framework in my life. And I'm sitting here and I, I quite often think, you know, I need a framework in my life. Um, <laughs> Like, it's just, I think as a front-end developer, I think like without a framework at the moment, then occasionally you get like, oh, I really should have one. And honestly, I've seen uh, I've seen a few posts about Svelte 
Um, Ignacio actually introduced it to me um, a while ago now. And then I saw that um, Svelte 3 had come out and there was like um, a lot of, there was, it was getting a bit of traction, uh, a bit of attention, um, not to, like, especially from, uh, from Ignacio um, within some message boards. Um, I think what the one thing that like stands out to me and like, I'd kind of like to explore a little bit more is the difference between like um, how it actually works. So Angular React, they do that. Yeah. They, they re-render everything. Um, Svelte, Svelte doesn't, it just, it just uh, re-renders exactly what it needs to. Um, but I'm kind of interested at like how that actually happens, how, um, how he's actually built that um, to work that way. Or is it just that, I mean, the mechanics of it are different, right? Like the, from yes. React and from, from React and from Angular. So like, and the one thing I keep on, I've read a few things and it says Svelte is not a framework, it's a compiler. And this is intriguing to me. So could you talk about that maybe a little? Yes, sure. Um, it's very easy. Uh, Rea um, React, no, uh, it's built. It's, I'm getting confused now. Uh, it's built. Uh, builds everything on uh, at compiling time, at build time, and it, it lets the user. It, it, then afterwards, the, the the rest of the code that you have here will run like pure JavaScript, vanilla JavaScript in, in the end user. This is unlike the other frameworks. The problems of the frameworks is that they create web components and they create a lot of toolings that they they include all of this into vendors and a big package that you send to the use to the end user. And when the end user or the the final user is going to open the website, the JavaScript first has to speak with the browser, telling, "Hey, we have extensions, we have new HTML components, and there is a lot of JavaScript that is not even meant for the end user. It's a it's a lot of boilerplate that is only for for the browser to know how it should behave in the future, but the application still didn't even run, and you spend a huge percentage of the of the of the application only to explain the browser how to behave and this is the, the the one of the things that he wanted to face he wanted not to have a framework something that has to be running uh, like uh, with uh, intelligence and uh, in in the browser but something that has to be very smart and very useful for the users so it should be more like a compiler something that helps you as a developer and not something that uh, makes everything so complicated for the end user, for the browser of the end user or the mobile in this case, when it has limited resources. Um, so one of the big things how Svelte works, as for your first question, how it works is very easily. Basically, Rich Harris, the creator of Svelte, uh, which by the way is a, a graphic designer from New York, New York Times, he realized he wanted to do graphics like, uh, you know, charts and things like so on. And he wanted to do it very efficiently. And he found out that um, the, the, the statement that we use in the code that is being used the most to define that something, something has been changed is the equal. Because if you are making a variable equal to something, it means that you are changing something in the page. So he decided that Every time you do an equal, uh, something that changes the value of something, the, uh, in that moment, we have to tell the language that that value has been changed. Instead of telling the component that the state has been, t uh, has been changed and you manually have to say this stage or this computed value in view or something has been, you manually had to set, set this up. Now, no, now it happens under the hood. The, only, the, the JavaScript that you wrote is mostly the same that is going to reach to the end user. But every time you do an assignment, you will have this, how he call it, invalidate function. That what it does is to tell the language again that this count counter that you are holding here has been changed. So now you have to re-render the, the, the places where count is being used. And, and so on. And this is the way we go from the change value to the render uh, portions of the page that requires to be rendered. Instead of going to this black box has been changed, let's render everything. And, and I think this is a very great approach. 
And I mean, I can remember a few years ago hearing Evan Yu on some podcast, uh, the, the creator of Vue, who was, it, this was before, I think it was just after Vue 2 came out and he was already thinking of the next version. And one of the features that was introduced to the JavaScript language was proxies. And for library builders and things like this, it was essential. This idea of having a essentially reactive object built into JavaScript built into the browser. So you didn't have to do that stuff for yourself. Instead, you could set up a proxy and having that in place would allow this sort of natural reactivity to happen. And it also meant that there was a lot less code written to handle this sort of stuff. And I, yeah, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think Svelte is based off of that concept as well of, of proxies. Mm, I'm not sure, but I know that in his meeting, he mentioned that this is one of the approaches that he could have done, but he decided to, to do something else. He mm. He's not um, working with the proxy. He didn't mention proxy, but it's at the end, proxy for those people who doesn't know, is simply an extension of an object that allows you to do actions, functions, or whatever thing you want, whatever you change the values of the object, whenever you set the values or whenever you date or get the values. Uh, the, you can do this, but the problem first, proxy is not compatible with the old browsers, as Belt does, True. it is. And secondly, uh, the, the problem of the proxy is that at the end, he was mentioning this, that this is like behaving with a state management again that you had to go manually to that value reassign the value and then let the software to know that something has been changed by doing the actions of the proxy with the function that you have ready there to to be watching the the the, the object but uh, he instead what he does is simply that at a small function every time you do a change of a value it's on a small function say every time you do an equal something equal to something let's call a function which is called invalidate that will trigger the changes on the website. It's simply that. Uh, so I think he he did his own test and decided that this approach is much faster because you do the call yourself, you only add two lines in the code and you don't have to have any proxy, you don't have to have any compatibility, you don't have to have a state management, you don't have to create a proxy for each element that has an equal or every variable that you're watching, you don't need to do anything of this. It's simply, a, a function call every time you you change the state of any value. So so I think his approach, he realized that even if you have all of these features, maybe going into the basic of JavaScript was even faster and more efficient. Yeah, that's great. Um, yeah, it, it's it's funny to me as well that we're, we've reached this stage in, you know, whether or not it's a framework, I mean, it's this concept of you write a little differently than you normally would, and you interact with the templates in particular, uh, and it outputs something the browsers can use. Um, but we've gotten to this stage with it where y you wonder why the other older ones were so complicated. I'm not saying like, I'm going to switch all my projects over to Svelte necessarily. But I mean, different people have tried to solve this idea of reactivity. I mean, RxJS is another example of that. It is a sort of reactivity system where you have streams of data and you can tap into them at various points and, and deal with it that way. I don't know, like, um, this is a, it's, it's exciting that things are getting more lightweight. I guess that's what I'm, I'm getting towards. And it, it leaves the room open for you to do more complex things in your code without having to worry as much about the bundle size. Yes. Uh, Go ahead, Scott. Yeah, yeah. I would also wonder, like, um, what the what the reaction would be of this approach from the other framework teams, like from the other, um, say, say like the Angular team or the React team. Uh, kind of tacking onto the point you just made there, Evan. Like, why were things done in the way that they were done? Is it just that nobody ever thought of this before? Is there a um, is there a good reason that React and uh, Angular worked in the way that they work, um, and now somebody's come along and found like a, a better way and a, a slimming things down. What well, I wonder what the downsides to Svelte's approach are. I mean, it, it all sounds positive, but like I guess that somebody must have a, an opinion on the other side of the coin. 
Yeah. I, I, you know, I, I think that the, the different, like, all right, first off, the language was different back when a lot of these frameworks started That's and true. it's evolved yeah. over time, but you, you have to have backwards compatibility. Um, so it's always a little easier to, to start fresh, but I, I think as well, there's this idea of a more of a kitchen sink that often goes in. I mean, Angular is definitely a, everything is there, um, including the kitchen sink, which is the expression. <laughs> and you, if you have a problem, there is almost always a way to solve it through there. It's not always perfect, but at least it's there. And then the other ones are like React depends on third-party applications to do that. And I, I guess it feels like they just get stuck in this this way of doing things and it's really hard to break out. That's not to say they don't want to. It's more just, you know, they can't necessarily do that again. That being said, the other frameworks brought us to a way of component thinking that was that was there before, but not to the extent it has been after we got into these frameworks. And once you get into the component mindset, then you do start to think in smaller chunks. And then the glue that strings them together can be much more lightweight because you're assuming that there will be a lot less shared information, uh, if that makes sense. Mm hmm. Yeah, it does to me. Yeah, it does. Like uh, I, and I think that your point about um, it's easier to start over once, like you're further down the line. Um, like so, the the new kid on the block has the advantage there of like they've, if you like, they've learned from the people that came before, um, and then they can do it better. Whereas like established things uh, are now harder to change. I mean, like for sure, like React okay. and Angular are embedded in so many things, so many companies, so many projects, like. Um, it's unthinkable to for for these things to actually change to something new. But um, I, I wonder I wonder now though whether they're thinking. I mean, they'll they'll have always had performance in mind. They'll have, and now something else is there to like to challenge the size of their frameworks. Maybe um, that kicks them on again, and they can actually make changes um, and make things better. So everybody again benefits. Um, I don't know. I, I mean, how do you see it, Ignacio? Do you see how you, you you worked in the other frameworks? You work. You still work in the other frameworks. You, you, you really like. Do you would you really feel that um, something like Svelte, this approach is like the new way for you and the way that you would start developing new projects, um, or would you see it very much as uh, you would pick the most appropriate tool for the job? Well, uh, that is a tricky question. Uh, because uh, from the previous question that you made, uh, we cannot compare Spelt with, for example, Angular, because Angular is a mature project, and it's true it can be slower or it can be much more bulky and and bigger and the, uh, for for the final user. But at the uh, at the same time, it has many more features that that Spelt doesn't have under the hood. For example, one that I miss. And I use always third-party tools to do this, or I have to do it myself. Is the router? The router is something amazing that uh, uh, Angular has, but it's normal. Once you finish your your initial statement of the the spelt of the of the framework, in this case, the spelt is not finished. We are expecting a new spelt very soon with ama amazing features uh, very soon. Probably it's spelt four for the twenty twenty one. This. Uh, and every time we change the version, it's truly not compatible with the previous one. But Angular is a very, very, very good and very set it, very, very well set it uh, uh, framework. And I still use even in Svelte when I'm writing Svelte, I use features from Angular. For example, not from Angular, but something that the team of Angular did, like the NGRX, the observables. Uh, Svelte has their own observables, but I want to to manage the process, the procedures of the observables. I want to modify the, the statements. I want to, to have control over them. And this is something amazing from Angular. So what I did is to bring the, the, this from them and, and use it in my, my own way in this belt. So is this belt perfect for all the cases in the new future? No, but it's much more simple to learn it than any other one. So if you are new in the market, if you... If you never touch the frameworks, or 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 you only know vanilla, actually moving to spell three is is extremely easy because it's almost like vanilla, almost like vanilla, 
and and if you want the feature, the good features from may, maybe other other frameworks that you like it, you can import it in in Spell Three. And if there is something that you did not find in in included in the library of Spell Three, like the router, there is always a great community bringing these tools out of the box. If you want to 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 uh, implement it uh, seamlessly uh, seamlessly to the to your project without any any complication on it. So at the end, you lose uh, trustability, I guess, or or in other word, uh, in other words, it will be uh, confidentiality uh, or uh, just trustability. I will say is the word uh, because you have to make the client to understand that this is something very new, and maybe in the future we cannot reach to do all the things that we want. Uh, without working hard on it and creating the the feature by yourself, but at the same time you can really really work with the the your client or with your projects very very fast, and you can go from from an idea to a, an established application in, in in no time compared to any other framework. So I, I think the pros and cons of this feature uh, really stand out with the with the. The, the good ones. So I don't know. Yeah. Uh, maybe Evan, you are you agree with me on this? I, I, I definitely do. And and what it calls to mind for me is the um, one of our our coworkers always uh, brings this up is that uh, they in in View three, so the new version of View, they um, spun off the reactivity system into its own dependency, meaning one you could swap it out potentially, but also that you can add that into your own systems separately from view. So I, I, I like that modernization of these things that you do something well, you make it standalone and then other people can use it and build new things off of it without having to take the whole framework alongside of it. Um, that, that said, that also was kind of how React worked from the start and it always turned me off of getting into react was that oh yeah you want a router here's four options and i'm like i i just want you to tell me what the right router is to use <laughs> um and, and angular had that which is why i kind of stuck with that at the start now that i'm more confident in how these things work i can branch out but um hand holding at the start can be really good and that, and that is another reason i like svelte is yeah they might not have a router yet um but they're also getting rid of the need for it in their new versions as i understand and the rest of the stuff, they really do hold your hand. Um, another thing to talk about in regards to this, I guess, is the documentation and, and sort of onboarding. Um, because Felt also has really, really good documentation and onboarding. Um, Scott, have you tried that yet for yourself? No, I haven't. But it is, it is definitely something on my, um, my to-do list. Um, I've... I have given myself like tasks to complete by the end of the year and like taking a, a look at Svelte and actually um, doing some tutorials on it is one. Um, so I'm glad that's, to hear that, that the, the, I'm glad to hear that the documentation is really good. Cause for me, that's the key thing. Like, um, like everything kind of has its place. If it's been, if it's been put there, if it's been put to the community, then it probably has its place. Um, but for me, the documentation the, is is where you live or die. Um, so as somebody who plans to take a look at this, um, as somebody who wants a framework in his life, um, I'm glad that I'm glad to hear that the documentation is good. Well, well go go even while we're talking, go to svelte.dev and uh, at the top of the page, click on tutorial, because I haven't seen something that was as immersive of a tutorial as this, where you just do it right away. And the thing is, they have this uh, REPL, it's called, um, where you can just experiment with Svelte and do anything you want. It's like a little mini code pen or, or um, code sandbox kind of built in. And it lets you see not just the result and the application you might build, but actually the JavaScript that it exports as well. So more than any other framework, being able to see what is being generated as a result of what you write uh, is pretty awesome, including the CSS, which I really I really enjoy that. And I like that this tool is simple enough that it lets that kind of 
it lets you get that sort of insight into how it actually functions and works. Yeah, I'm just taking a look at it. I'm, I am actually just taking a look at it right now. That's really good. That's really nice. Like just to take you to have you to have the the little code editor there with your with your output and um mm -hmm. and like what you should put in and what's gonna, yeah that's amazing. That's exactly what I want. One of the other things that um that bugs me is any kind of implied knowledge. So something like this that would actually take you through step by step. I mean, it really feels like they want you to use this, like. And that's just looking at the first couple of pages of it. Yeah, that's incredible. Exactly. Great job. I, I okay. guess that the, the, the good thing of this is that the creator is a design uh, editor and he has been working, doing a lot of documents for many pages in the New York Times. New York Times. So I guess that he, he really knows how to write documentation here. Definitely true. Um, Okay, one other uh, thought, Ignacio, is um, is there anything that this is sort of missing uh, for you at the moment? I mean, I know that you and I kind of, you helped me big time on this sort of uh, POC that I was working on. And because we were doing it as a web component, which Svelte works really well as a web component, but it took us a bit to find some of these more obscure things that I wanted to do. Um, have you encountered many of those things or, or, or what do you think it's it's heading towards? Actually, I found many, but not actually in the Svelte itself, but in the still the fact that it's a, it's a framework that has only two years ish mm. and or one year, one year ish. I think not even two. And, and many of these are, it doesn't have support to type a script by default. You need a preprocessor. It doesn't have support for SAS by default. You need a preprocessor. And the more you rely on third uh, libraries, the more chances you have that you will need more time to configure, more issues on the, on the way. And normally when you start a project, it's a little bit more complicated if you want to have these things uh, available at the beginning. And you're going to spend one entire day only to have the perfect a start that you want to have um, because also uh, they are not using Webpack, which is the default for the rest of the implementation. They are using Rollup, which is another uh, compiler. And this compiler is more meant for libraries, but um, nowadays it's so powerful that you can do it for also entire applications as well. The good thing of Rollup is that it's much easier to be read, but it's something new that you also have to learn. So if you go with the spelt, you also have to understand Rollup at the same time. Um, well, Scott, so Scott, you 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 implemented Rollup on, uh, or you switched from I think Webpack to Rollup, right? On some I side did, project, yeah. yeah, on a side How project. Was that for you? Um, actually, I found it much more accessible than Webpack, um, and the output file, the the output JS in the end was much smaller. Um, I didn't think it was, I think that with Rollup, um, actually the like learning how to do it and learning, like looking at the config file and everything, um, it felt like the entry level for that was so much lower than Webpack. Mm -hmm. I mean, anybody who's listening to this, um, anybody who's gone in and like use Webpack knows that it gets complicated. It gets this all sorts of intricacies that you that you need to figure out. Honestly, with Rollup, I really found it um, like quite simple to do. But that, having said that, the projects that I was actually implementing it on, um, there was no like I didn't need Transpiler or anything like that. It was just for um, uh, for evergreen browsers, um, and it was just to produce like an iffy uh, in the end. So it was for me, it was um, something that I found really quite straightforward um and i was and as somebody who's looked at webpack in the past and thought what the hell is going on here that was really re that was actually really refreshing so um yeah i'd urge people to give that a try nice i remember okay. i remember the, the 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 fact that webpack one small detail of this that i still don't know why it's like this the you had to read from the bottom to the top because when you apply rules Nobody, nobody tells you in any guide that you can find online that the rules are written from the bottom to the top. So the the functions that you process the SAS when you're processing this, you first process, uh, you want to first process this in and convert it into text. You need to put this at the bottom. Then the text you want it into CSS. Then you need to put this in the middle. 
it's something that when you go to roll up, you see you you are you are thinking why why I spend all my life in Webpack. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. It is true. Yeah, I mean, as long as the other things that you need uh, occasionally, like post CSS and um, I don't know whatever else there might be, <clears throat> are supported, I don't oh, see the reason to this, stick with one thing. Speaking of this, Svelte in the new version is not going to use rollup. Just to let you know, maybe it's going to use it as a side thing to give support, but now we are going to move toward another very good uh, compiler. Let's say so, uh, Snowpack. Very, Snowpack, very right. Yes. And the new spell will be even running faster with this. Yeah, maybe before we wrap up, um, can you break down a bit of what that final talk at the Svelte kind of conference was from, from Rich Harris um, about what's coming and what that means? Like, you know, no, no, I mean, what the point of that was and, and what the vision going forward is. Well, uh Yes, uh, the last talk he he spent some time explaining that uh, he want to merge because one of the issues of most of the frameworks, if not all, is that you had to face with something that frameworks are not good by default with the CEO. They are not good by default for accessibility and things like this because they are re they are rendered they are rendering your application at runtime. It, it means, in other words, it it renders when it's already your page uh, mm, loaded from the from the server so so at the initially you don't have any text google cannot read the the titles because it requires to be rendered first and so on and spelt is now fa uh, he want to solve this issue by merging uh, ssr which means server side rendering and he want to instead of doing client side rendering he want to do server side rendering by default so you don't have to have a special tools for for a spell to run uh, first the the, the server side rendering so you can include the CEO. Uh, so this will be by default uh, the way the, the approach that he wants to achieve with the new spell. And also, this when you render the the spell from the server, uh, you, uh, the page will load much much faster. So he will manage even to do it faster than probably using only JavaScript. Vanilla JavaScript is one of his channels. He said it's still this is still on the way of of this, but uh, server side rendering will give a lot of uh, feature, good features for the society because server side rendering means that it can be catched, and catched means that the hard job that the client server side rendering has to do it doesn't have to be done anymore because it's only catched, and you only have to do what they call it hydration to to reactivate the, comp the components and i think a part of the server side rendering he's yeah he's also going to implement typescript by default and as a not by default but, but as a as an option that you you don't require any external library to work with it and i hope also sas because if you are going with one you you should go for everything uh and and yes, I think every uh, and well, and the most important part of this is that it, it will be using module modules to load the scripts, which means yeah. that uh, with a snowpack or without a snowpack, because there are a lot of compilers that use similar modules behavior, um, the the components will have uh, they will be standalone and they will be running with their own script. And if you are not going to use that component, that component is not even going to be loaded to your page. You you only you only you are only going to download those components that are visible by your view or visible by your your page that you are currently at that moment. And and using a script um, with the module, uh, I don't know if you know the that you add the type module uh, in the script. You can actually uh, write code without even compiling. You don't need to use Babel, you don't need to make this to, 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 you don't have to create modules connected to each other like Webpack does in, uh, inside, inside of it. So you can require one of the other. Uh, all of this is working already because nowadays only Internet Explorer is the, is the one that doesn't allow this, but the modules, uh, script models is something that all major browsers and with major is 95% of the almost 95% of the of the market 
allows you to use this. And now with this modularization, by default, you don't, the build time uh, goes down from uh, one minute for a big application to a few seconds, like uh, probably even five or 10 seconds, because uh, you're not going to be building the component twice. You only build right. uh, the modules that has been changed every time you do a change in a component. So you only uh, build uh, the changes, not build, you, you don't build the, everything over and over. Yeah. And I, and I, and I think what's great about this and, and Svelte in general, but the mindset behind it is that you're doing things that improve the developer experience. Yes. I mean, faster build times and, you know, ease of uh, writing code that that's great, but that it's going hand in hand with things that benefit the end user. So, I mean, and it's not like the other Play, people aren't, aren't doing this as well, right? Well, Webpack 5 came out with Module Federation and it's attempting to solve this problem. Angular's next version should have at least the beginnings of uh, lazy loaded components. I mean, everyone's starting to move in this direction, but it's nice to see someone getting there first because, again, they are focusing on making it simple, making it close to the wires or the, the rails, so to speak. It's, um, it's a nice time period we're in. Okay, we're getting to that time where we need to start to wrap up. But first, we want to go into our uh, segment, True Heroes. In this segment, we want to highlight a few true, uh, true front-end heroes working across the planet and thank them for all that they do. And this time around, our nominee is Rich Harris. Um, Rich, as we've said before, is the creator of Svelte. Um, he, what, what I like most about encountering him online is the care and thought that he puts even into Twitter interactions. Um, you can see interesting conversations with, you know, luminaries in the field always get started around his topics. He um, presents himself well when he does his sort of, you know, fireside chat type of things. Um, generally just um, an intelligent guy who's a pleasure to listen to and has been doing really good things to move our community forward. Um, Scott or Ignacio, do you want to tack on anything there? Well, uh... I would like to say that I spoke with him directly many times. Uh, if you want to speak with him, uh, it's not always available, but you can always go to the Discord channel of Spelt. He's very active even there, uh, even um, um, in, in this community of, of people. And if you tag him, if you write anything and, and that is not like very basic and you ask him for his opinion, he will answer you. If you say, uh, that you want to talk with him about something, he will give you a moment and you, you will be able to talk with him directly. He's a person very active in the social media. And, and this is very important for a person who is driving a new way of thinking uh, to, the, to, the, to the planet. And I don't yeah, know. I would... Thanks. Yeah, I would, I would just echo that. Like the, um, uh, having seen him um, doing some presentations, I've always been impressed. I think like he's very, um, very easy to listen to. His presentations are really well thought out. And I think that um, as I've discovered during this podcast and probably ruining the rest of my day uh, in terms of productivity, um, like his, like the thought and care that he's put into like getting people to adopt felt um, by even just doing this tutorial um, uh, and making it really work and on point, I think is is incredible. And I think that's really something that the rest of the community can uh, could take a look at uh, and follow the lead. So yeah, really well done, great job. Perfect, good. And any um, proper hero is a well rounded one. So we want to share some simple musical picks. So Scott, what's the favorite thing you've been listening to lately? Well, um, uh, just I, I do have a music recommendation, but also like as a little curveball, um, I want to mm. recommend uh, another podcast, which is nothing to do with the front end. Um, it's called the Jason and OC podcast. Um, now, nominally, this is uh, well, they're two guys who um, are former NFL players, and so nominally, you think, oh, this is going to be a, a sports podcast. Actually, like it's just two guys uh, speaking about stuff in general. They touch on the sport a little bit but more on how it relates to things that are going on in society and uh, their experiences at the moment. And I just find the the two guys are so easy to listen to. Um, and I think it would be, it's really worth checking out, even if you don't uh, like the sport. Um, so that's the Jason and OC podcast. Uh, music wise, I've been listening to an album by Bright Eyes. 
um, called Down in the Weeds Where the World Once Was. Um, I'm a bit of a uh, Conor O'Burst fan anyway. Um, and so like, this is their first album that's come out for for a while. And I just got had it on repeat. So yeah, that for me is what I've been listening to. Thanks. Um, Ignacio, do you have a pick in mind? Well, mm, I, I would say recently, no. But this weekend, actually, I was actually going into the past, like 10 or 15 years into the past, checking what I, the music I was hearing in the past. And uh, I think I was a, a, a rock lover, that a, a rock pop lover in the past, because uh, I will recommend now, again, uh, Huba Stank. Uh, the reason, uh, very very old song, Evanescence, and all these songs. I don't know how how we ended up here. Uh, <laughs> 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 I, I I don't know because this time these people were considered at the same time rock and at the same time kind of emo music. Uh, uh, very like very sad songs, but it was the things that I was hearing uh, back in the time. Instead of programming or doing things, like I think I was. 15 years old but back in the time I'm wearing uh, eyeliner <laughs> but, <laughs> wearing eyeliner <laughs> yes <laughs> I, I, okay. exactly I have the, the black eyes it's true the, the, not really really uh, I was completely different compared to now and and it's just still the music is something that I still like today not the how I was dressing but but I like the music yeah that's absolutely fair. I mean, um, I'm going to do a deeper reach as well because um, I've, you know, I, I haven't been finding a lot of good new stuff lately. I mean, there's a few things that pop up, but it's not like it's too new for me necessarily to recommend. But um, this one I keep coming to over and over and over again. It's an album by an artist called Tumani Diabate, um, and it's called The Mande Variations. And he is a famous... Um, Kora player, which is this 21 string uh, harp from West Africa. Um, I guess he's from Mali. And yeah, it's, it's really good. <laughs> it's I don't even remember where I found it. I, I, I really think it was like 10 years ago when I first encountered it. Um, but it's really good music. And it's, it's different. It's rhythmic and um, very interesting tones. And yeah, I don't know. Check it out if you have time. It's, it's, it's an interesting one. I will. Okay. Good. So it looks like that's all the time we have for today, folks. Thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed the show, you should like, heart, or star us in your podcatcher of choice. Reviews and ratings are how the fancy algorithms help people find our content, and the power to help is within you. If you have any questions or topics you'd like covered in our next episode, send a tweet to us at Heroes Front End, and we'll add it to our list. Until next time, Heroes, remember, with great front-end power comes great responsibility. See you next time.